Hello everyone. You are probably looking at this photo and wondering what in the world it could possibly be. It's an old photo of myself at the tree line on Mount St. Helens' southern face. The date was April the 29th, 1980. I was 27 years old, probably old enough to know better, but I had a dream, a dream of climbing a mountain. Almost everything I have ever done in life, I have done late. In fact, I would venture to say that when I die, they will probably say, there lies the body of the late John Williams. Today, I will be telling you about a mountain climber, a mountain climber who had absolutely no climbing experience, a climber who had zero climbing gear for his climb, a climber who was told by a prominent geologist that he was probably the last person to climb Mount St. Helens from base to summit before the historic and deadly eruption of May 18, 1980. If you haven't guessed by now, I am that mountain climber. I climbed Mount St. Helens April 30th, 1980. I photographed the crater and the summit on my climb. I was told that at least one geologist and one geology professor entered the crater on the day of my climb. Unfortunately, I had to hide from their helicopters to avoid detection. My story has not been widely told and is a part of Mount St. Helens' pre-1980 eruption history. I am a lifelong artist and I will be il illustrating my story with paintings, mixed media illustrations, and photos taken on my climb. Here are a few examples of my work. I must qualify that not all of my illustrations are as finished as my paintings. I would like to add that I am not the only artist to record an eruption of Mount St. Helens. In the late 1840s, frontier artist Paul Kane recorded the 1847 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens had been erupting from 1800 to 1854. These eruptions would set the stage for the historic eruption of Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1980. My story begins on March 27, 1980. I was stationed with the Fleet Marine Force at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. I was not a Marine, but was in the Navy Medical Corps. It was unusual duty in that we wore Marine uniforms, but with Navy insignia. I volunteered for duty with the Fleet Marines to avoid sea duty, but that is another story. I was scheduled to be discharged from the Navy April 9, 1980. On March 27th, while in my room with four of my roommates, the evening news came on. The announcer was describing the initial 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. I turned to my roommates who were playing cards and announced, Do you see that mountain? When I get out of the Navy, I'm going to climb that mountain. They all laughed and said, Oh yeah, right. After my discharge, I began to make plans to climb Mount St. Helens. I went to the local libraries and gathered all the information on the mountain that I could. I bought a Rand McNally Road Atlas and removed the page containing Washington State. I gathered newspaper articles and even bought a few tabloids with stories on Mount St. Helens. While preparing for my climb, I heard news reports stating a group of men had landed on the summit of Mount St. Helens in a helicopter and had attempted to film a Rainier beer commercial. They were arrested and fined for their effort. I also heard reports about Harry Truman and his refusal to leave his Spirit Lake Lodge. I liked Harry's attitude as I thought it was not the government's job to protect you from yourself and your choices. When I got back home from the military, I purchased a mountaineering type backpack and necessary camping gear. I loaded my pack to 66 pounds and began hiking up and down my dad's backyard, which was about a thousand yards long and ending in a creek. It tilted in places to about 10 degrees. In the end, it would prove to be of little help. 
I had just come from sea level and my dad's house was about six or 700 feet above sea level. I was going to be hiking in an area far above that, all the way up to 9,577 feet. My brother expressed an interest in accompanying me on my climb. He told me he had to wait two weeks though to get approval for vacation time off. I could not afford to wait as I was running out of money. I was also hearing on the news the mountain was calming down. This was important to me and that I realized Mount St. Helens was not as dangerous as say Mount Everest, but with the eruption possibility it was running a close second. My brother had a friend who claimed he was the second best rock climber in the state of Missouri. How such things are determined I do not know. In any case, I tried to get him to accompany me on my climb, but he refused, claiming it would be impossible to climb. In retrospect, it was a good thing I did not wait two weeks for my brother to get time off. If I had, we most likely would have been there at the time of the May 18th eruption. My brother also had a bad habit of claiming he wanted to do things, but would back out later. I had planned on taking a camera to record my climb. I had a Pentax Auto 110 I had purchased at the base exchange at Camp Lejeune. It had interchangeable lenses, something rare for a 110 camera. I unfortunately could not afford the telephoto lenses. It had one major drawback in that a time shutter release was not a feature on this camera. It was lightweight, however, and perfect in that respect. To get around the lack of a timer on the shutter release, my dad came up with a great solution. This is remarkable in that he had misgivings about my trip. He told me as much when he asked me one day, John, do you really think you should do this? I answered, I just have to do this, Dad. Surprisingly, he said, I understand, and he began to help me build a shutter release cable. What he came up with was this, a flathead screw that would thread into the hole for the shutter cable release button, a cut out piece of plastic from a bread tie in the shape of a circle would be super glued to the top of the flathead screw. The groove in the screw would be enhanced using a hacksaw. Special care would be given to ensure no glue entered the groove in the screw head. Kite string would then be threaded into the screw head groove. The string would then be wrapped around the camera one loop and would depress the shutter when pulled on. I modified this procedure slightly at the time I actually took my photos. I placed my Marine Corps fighting knife in the snow below the, my tripod and placed the string under the guard directly below the tripod. This ensured the string did not become stuck while wrapped around the camera. It was not a full loop, but a half loop. My stepmother sewed a white sheet into a camouflage suit for use on the snow fields and, and around the mountain. I never got a chance to use it, however, as most of the snow in and around the mountain was covered in ash. The morning of Wednesday, April the 23rd, 1980, my dad dropped me off at the bus station in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. This particular leg of the trip was pretty uneventful. The most notable thing I remember was a brief stop at the bus station in Goodland, Kansas. The street as I remember it was gravel, and the bus station had a giant submarine net float attached to a pole above the facade of the bus station. It was painted to look like a globe. I remember thinking to myself that this was probably the only world most Goodland residents ever get to see. On the morning of Thursday, April 24th, 1980, the bus stopped in Denver, Colorado. This was notable because a passenger complained that someone had locked themselves in the bus's restroom and had been there an unusually long time. The passenger knocked on the door repeatedly but got no response. The passenger also thought that perhaps they had suffered a medical emergency. 
The driver acted as if he had seen this situation before and stopped the bus. He walked back to the restroom door and began beating on the door. He said, I know what you're doing in there, and if you don't come out of there right now, I'm going to call the police. The person in the toilet made no response. The driver then said, that does it, I'm calling the police. The police arrived after about 10 minutes and boarded the bus. They began rapping violently on the restroom door with their nightsticks. This brought a response. The door opened slowly and a glue bagger or glue sniffer stepped out. The nearest police officer grabbed him by the arm and began pushing him toward the front of the bus. A two foot long rope of mucus was hanging from the glue sniffer's nose. It swayed back and forth as he was escorted off the bus. The passengers were leaning as far as they could away from the aisle as he passed. Some may say, what do you expect riding on a bus? Nowadays, you can find the same types of activities on a passenger flight. On the morning of April, or Friday, April the 25th, we arrived in Salt Lake City, Utah. I enjoyed getting my first look at the Great Salt Lake. Later in the day, we passed the Snake River Canyon. The driver announced that this was where stuntman Evil Knievel had attempted to jump it on a motorcycle. On this leg of the trip, I sat next to a guy on the bus who said he was a professor of geology from the University of Oregon. I wonder if this was the Professor Leonard Palmer of the University of Oregon, Portland. I told him my plans, and he told me a lot of things about volcanoes and the possible dangers I was facing, especially from pyroclastic flows. He also told me about a geologist friend of his and five other geologists who were working near the summit of a volcano in Central America and were killed by a pyroclastic flow. I had never heard of pyroclastic flows. Some might call this a coincidence. I would call it providence. Later that night, we passed the Three Sisters area of Oregon. I remember looking out of the window of the bus at the moonlit sky and seeing a sharply pointed black peak highlighted by the moon. We stopped at a restaurant and we all went in to get a break, some refreshment and food. I sat alone and felt extremely isolated. I can understand people not wanting to talk to a guy dressed as I was, with camouflage pants, British commando sweater, and a well-worn Marine Corps campaign hat. Saturday, April 26th, we arrived early in the morning in Portland, Oregon. I didn't exit the bus as the same bus was going to be used to take me to my final destination, Woodland, Washington. Again, I had a strong sense of loneliness watching many of the people I'd been riding with leave the bus. I had not been in Portland since my first hitchhiking trip west back in 1974. Our next stop was Woodland, Washington, my final destination. As the driver was unloading the luggage for those getting off in Woodland, I had a sense of panic. It was not where I wanted to get off. I had planned on climbing the north face of Mount St. Helens as I had heard on television. The mountain was being monitored with telescopes in Cougar, Washington, south of the mountain. Somehow I felt as though I had made a serious error and picking Woodland as my final destination. I asked the driver if there was any way I could continue on to Longview. He seemed miffed by my question, but he said I, he could only allow it if he took part of my return ticket as compensation. I agreed to this. I arrived in Longview and began walking to Interstate 5 to begin hitching a ride to the mountain. When I arrived at I-5, many passing drivers were yelling obscenities at me and calling me a hippie. Some were throwing beer bottles and others were displaying hand gestures. It was very discouraging. I was in the northbound lane of I-5 but began walking south towards some bridges crossing the Coweman River at 13th Avenue. Here is a Google map photo of the bridges. I left I-5 and crossed 13th Avenue, 
climbed the levee and sat under the northbound I-5 bridge next to the Coeman River, totally discouraged. I was thirsty and began thinking what a fool I was to think I could climb Mount St. Helens. This was probably a bad decision on my part, but I filled my canteen from the Coeman River. I did, however, place the required number of water purifying iodine tablets in my canteen. Frankly, I was completely discouraged and was wondering what I was thinking, trying such a thing. It's time to face reality and give it up. I started back for the bus station on the northbound side of I-5. After trudging for five minutes with my head down in discouragement, I happened to look up and noticed a red Camaro stopped with its warning lights flashing. My first thought was that it was probably a person with car trouble. It would help to get a ride to the bus station, though. And as I approached the passenger side door, the window rolled down and a young lady with dark hair asked if I needed a ride. I said I did, and she told me we could put my backpack in the trunk, which we did. And then she asked me where I was from, and after I told her, she asked what I was doing in Longview. I told her I'd come out to climb Mount St. Helens, but I was having trouble getting there. She said that is no problem, as she had some friends who would be happy to take me to the mountain. She then asked me, if I would be up for stopping at a local lager bar in Longview and having a couple of beers. I said, yes, of course. The lager bar was a place called Porky's Tavern. I did some online research and discovered it's no longer called Porky's Tavern, but is now called Porky's Public House. Porky's was empty at the time. We were the only people besides a bartender in the bar. They were selling colored t-shirts with a high contrast profile of an erupting Mount St. Helens. The ash cloud was depicted as being low on the horizon and moving east. I bought one, a tan colored shirt with the phrase it read, where were you when Mount St. Helens blew? The words you and blue were in red, the rest were in black. A small addendum at the bottom read, Porky's Tavern, Longview, Washington. I was hoping my climb would give that phrase special meaning. The shirt cost $9. Funny what you remember. After a couple of beers, she took me to meet her friends. Her friends lived in a fairly nice brick ranch style house. The brick was dark brown in color. A school bus converted into a camper was in the driveway as well as a small 1950s, 1960s camping trailer. A man who looked to be in his mid to late 60s lived in it. I think he was the father of one of the residents of the house. A couple of cars were also parked in the driveway. After being introduced to her friends, my friend and benefactor left. I never saw her again. I slept on a large couch in the living room. I remember hearing a news report on the radio they had on in the living room that Mount St. Helens's north face was swelling at the rate of five feet a day. In researching these numbers to ensure their validity, I discovered they varied from five to 5.5 and six feet a day. You would think I would have been alarmed. Instead, I was secretly happy to hear this. Before I left Kansas City, I was hearing news reports. The mountain was calming down and would probably go dormant soon. I was disappointed because it would take some of the danger of or Everest factor out of the climb. This was also important in that I had planned on climbing the North Face because I heard on Kansas City news outlets that there were telescopes monitoring the mountain from the from Cougar, Washington. And since I had planned on climbing at night, utilizing moonlight, I changed my plans. I did not know that, that at the time that this was a common practice in mountaineering as the snow was packed and frozen, making it much easier to walk on at night. Sunday, April 27th, 1980. My host graciously made me a breakfast of bacon, eggs, and hash browns. 
We boarded the converted school bus and made our way down to Woodland, Washington. The town I had decided was not where I wanted to depart the bus. Apparently that decision, as bad as it was, turned out to be Providence as well. The only thing of note on the way south was seeing the old Trojan nuclear power plant in Rainier, Oregon. We reached Highway 503 and headed northeast toward Cougar, Washington. We stopped at a point where Mount St. Helens became visible. The driver stopped the bus, turned and asked me if I really thought I could climb that without climbing gear and experience. He added that Mount St. Helens is used by climbing, a climbing school to train its pupils. They are required to climb it to graduate. I had to admit, from this perspective, it looked formidable. The sun was reflecting off the ice and snow at the summit. I hesitated and answered, yeah, I think I can. This question gave me insight into what my host really thought of my climb. Somewhere along the way, we left the highway and began to travel logging roads. At one point, we left the regular logging road and started down an old abandoned logging road. It had old snow drifts that had melted and frozen, old coatings of dirt and fallen tree limbs that lay everywhere. The road had a steep slope ascending above it and a steep slope descending below about 200 to 300 feet. After a short distance, the bus became stuck in one of the old snowdrifts. The driver began gunning the engine in an effort to proceed. As he did, the rear end of the bus began to slide toward the edge of the narrow road and the 200 and 300 foot drop. If my host doubted my judgment, I was definitely doubting theirs. The bus was equipped with a large pot-bellied stove. The stove was surrounded by loose red bricks placed around it without mortar. There were also two twin-sized metal beds that looked like military surplus. A small stack of firewood was also stacked near the stove. I went to the windows on the downside of the road and wondered what it would be like rolling down that steep grade with a heavy pot-bellied stove hundreds of bricks, the beds, a stack of firewood. I imagined it would be a lot like spending some time in a blender. Fortunately, the driver decided to try backing out of the road. This too was fraught with danger. We drove around on the regular logging roads until I was sure these people did not know where they were going. We finally stopped at a point about five miles southwest of Mount St. Helens. We had to stop because a large tree was blocking the road. I later discovered in geologist Richard Waite's book, In the Path of Destruction, that Weyerhaeuser lumber felled trees intentionally across roads to keep people out of the restricted area around Mount St. Helens. My hosts were unfazed by this setback and they began rigging long logging chains to the front of the bus and to the log, which was about four feet thick and 80 feet long. With each backward surge of the bus, the front of the bus would pop off the road about two or three feet. Everyone on the bus exited the bus except for the driver. I climbed above the road to take a photo of their effort. A line of sightseers was forming behind us, and the first car behind us contained an engineer with the Washington State Department of Transportation. He and his girlfriend were in the area scouting for a good place to hunt elk. My hosts were successful in removing the tree after several attempts. My hosts were busy stowing the chains while the backlog of cars passed us and went on up the hill. I say hill but hiking up it later felt like hiking up a mountain with my 66 pound pack. And my host drove two or 300 feet and decided to stop and let me out. That was as far as they were going to take me. It was still a considerable distance to the top of the hill or mountain. I thank them for their efforts in getting me to this point. There were two males and three females in the group. One of the males, a guy with blondish hair that he wore in a ponytail, remarked, 
You shouldn't mess with Mother Nature. It will get you. I had spent a lot of time in the woods at that point in my life, in areas with grizzly bears and other hazards, and my experience has been that in this world, people are the most dangerous thing you can encounter sometimes. I was still grateful for the ride, but puzzled at the comment. Wild animals do what they do by instinct. People usually do destructive things to others with determined malice. I began to trudge up the road with my 66-pound pack and my sea-level lung acclimation. After a short stretch, I was sweating profusely. I took off my sweater and hiked in my white long underwear shirt, and I was feeling dismayed because I had no idea where I was or where the mountain was. I reached the top of the upward grade and saw a couple sitting on a large log eating sandwiches and drinking soft drinks. They saw my exa exhausted condition and invited me to eat lunch with them. I was able to see the mountain at this point. It looked to be about five miles away. After my short hike to this point, I realized I was facing a real challenge. My new friends asked me what I was doing in the area. I told them I was going to climb Mount St. Helens. The driver of the car then said he would take me closer to the mountain to a roadblock. He introduced himself as Gerald P. Edwards and gave me his business card. He was an engineer with the Washington State Department of Transportation. The woman with him was named Mary Legree and was his girlfriend. After our lunch, they drove me to a roadblock manned by county deputies. A line of vehicles about 10 cars long led up to the roadblock. Gerald suggested I exit the car and see if I could get access. As I approached the deputy in charge, took one look at me and the way I was dressed. He looked me in the eye and he said, I know what you're here for. And if I catch you inside this restricted zone, I'm going to burn you. I never got a chance to speak. I returned to the car and Gerald told me not to worry. He would drop me off a short distance west of the roadblock, out of the sight of the deputies. He said there was a small river or creek just south of the highway. I could hike up that and get around the roadblock. Gerald drew me a map of the way to the mountain. Once I got around the roadblock, he told me to take the first logging road on the left past the roadblock. This would take me toward the mountain. I would then follow the logging road until I came to a large rock on the right side of the road with the words Bluebird or Blue Jay painted on it. The rock was the head of the trail that would take me to Mount St. Helens. He drew me a map on a small piece of scrap paper just in case. I thank Gerald and Mary for their hospitality and help. I promised to send them some of my photos. I then hurried off the road and into the woods along the stream. I had a new strength as my goal was now within reach. I hiked up beyond the roadblock, but not too far, as I did not want to accidentally bypass the logging road. I found a place next to the stream that was covered in a deep carpet of moss. A smaller stream entered the larger stream from the north. It was small enough to step over. I stripped down and washed off on a rock ledge or waterfall set in the smaller stream. I placed my sleeping bag next to it, about six or seven feet east of it. The water was as cold as ice. After my bath, I opened a can of Spam and ate all of it. I slid into my sleeping bag for some much needed sleep. The sun was well gone from the horizon. Dusk was quickly closing in. As I lay, my, lay in my bag, I could hear something moving through the woods to the south-southeast, accompanied by a cr crunching, crashing sound. My first thought was that it was a bear. I wasn't looking forward to getting out of my sleeping bag and dealing with that. All of a sudden, the ground began to heave and dead limbs began to fall from the large trees all around me. The trees were swaying back and forth and creaking. The sensation I got was of being on an air mattress at the beach and riding up and down on large swells. 
I sat up wide-eyed. In my mind, I could see a hot wall of lava moving down the valley to burn me alive. The earthquake registered at 4.9. The earthquake that set off the May 18th eruption registered at a 5.0. After the earthquake fear subsided, I quickly fell asleep. I awoke in the dim light of an overcast dawn. I quickly packed my gear and got moving. I was excited and ready to finally set foot on the mountain. I walked through the woods a distance, then decided to hike along the highway. This served two purposes. It was easier and faster to move down the highway, and I wanted to be sure I did not miss a logging road leading to the mountain. I was worried that maybe a police car or emergency vehicle might see me and report me or apprehend me. I would hike in short speed marches, then stop and listen for approaching vehicles. If I heard one, I decided I would rush back into the woods to avoid detection. After what seemed a short hike, I came to the logging road on my left. The first thing I encountered on the road as I traveled north was a large open lot with two beige metal buildings. They looked like garages and were fairly large. I only saw one vehicle or piece of equipment. After 42 years, my memory's hazy on what it was. It was either an orange front end loader or log loader. I assumed the whole complex was vacated and all the equipment was evacuated. I assumed the equipment was left behind because it was inoperable. I hiked past the complex as quickly as I could in case someone might still be there in an office facing the road and report me. I hiked on as quickly as I could and it finally came to the rock with Bluebird or Blue Jay painted on it. As I had hiked north along the road to the rock, a nagging fear that I might have the wrong road kept going through my mind. The trail when I found it, ran in a northeasterly direction, just as the map stated. I hiked for what may have been an hour, and the trail turned north. It also was covered in deep snow, and that was wet and soft, about the consistency of a snow cone. The going was tough, as I had no snowshoes. I would walk 10 or 12 feet, and I would sink into the snow up to my waist. I would have to throw off my pack and then extricate myself from the snow. I would sometimes put my pack back on only to sink back in the snow once again. I discovered an interesting hack to avoid this problem. I noticed that the drip line around the trees was frozen and hard from the melting of the snow on the limbs. I began walking from tree to tree along the drip lines. In some places this was impossible as the trees were spaced too far apart. And I would again sink down in the snow and go through the whole th procedure as I had before. After hiking a short while, the snow got firmer as I gained altitude, and this no longer was a problem. I came to a tree, a tree-covered ridge about 300 feet high. I headed to what I thought was north and went around the end of it. I saw another ridge behind it about the same height. I started walking between them. I think I was heading south. I stopped a short way in and decided to climb the ridge, thinking it might be a shortcut to the tree line and the mountain. I began climbing, kicking steps in the snow. The going was tough, and after climbing about 150 feet, I realized what a foolish thing I was doing. I was carrying a 66 pound pack and I weighed about 190 pounds. If the snow gave way under my feet, I would slide 150 feet, possibly break my ankle, my legs or hip. I would be out there alone and no one would know I was there. I was afraid I might break my steps trying to go back down so I kept on climbing. I began kicking steps earnestly and carefully. I proceeded slowly and timidly. The sun came out briefly, 
two or three times, and finally I reached the top only to see a large snow field, but no mountain. The clouds closed in once more, this time for good. I was exhausted. I saw a snow hummock and sat down next to it to rest. I didn't even bother to take my pack off. I laid back on it exhausted. I was dismayed and thought for sure I was going to see the mountain. I walked to what I thought was east across the snow field and then brief burst of sun helped me determine my directions. Not long into my walk, I came to a ravine. I had the idea that maybe I could use it to get off this ridge. I realized there was a danger in this as well. I could slide down the ravine and come to a drop off or I could get or it could get so steep I could slide uncontrolled into an obstacle and seriously injure myself. I had a short length of rope which I tied to my pack which I let slide down in front of me. I thought that maybe my pack would act as a cushion of sorts if I began to slide too fast and hit an object such as a fallen tree or a large rock lar lodged in the ravine after a short slide, I reached the bottom safely. I walked east from there, and the area at the bottom of the ridge was like a marsh, mossy and contained a lot of marsh-type plants. Perhaps this area was slightly geothermically heated? I don't know. And not far from this spot, I came upon an elk skeleton. It had no antlers and no evidence of entrails or hide were present. The sinews and joints were in place, and there was a scant presence of flesh still on the bones. The bones had a bluish-white color to them. I thought to myself, this will probably be me in a day or two. I continued hiking for another hour or so in a northeasterly direction. The train was becoming increasingly steep with not much snow. I then came to a narrow trail with a light gravel on it. It zigzagged upward on a large rocky prominence. My first impression was it was a game trail, possibly an elk trail. I hiked to near the top. I was able to see a large snow field stretching out to the north. I had reached my goal. I could see the mountain rising into the dense cloud cover. As I pondered my good fortune, I became aware of a change on the wind intermittent gusts that died down to a quiet nothing. The smell of snow was in the air, and the clouds were looking ragged. A snowstorm was coming. As a side note, you can smell snow and rain coming. It's kind of a bittersweet smell. It's a smell of ozone in the air. I decided to set up camp for the night. I gathered a bed of pine boughs and spread one of my tarps over it then the other over my sleeping bag. I was sleeping under one of the trees along the trail. I noticed a very large pine resin ball on the side of the tree and gathered it for use later in case I had to start a fire. I stripped down to my underwear and slid into my bag. I fell asleep fast. I awoke the next morning and everything was pitch black. I pulled the tarp away from my face and a huge pile of snow hit my face. About eight inches of snow had fallen during the night. I noticed that my feet felt wet and cold. Sometime during the night, the top tarp had pulled away from the bottom of my sleeping bag. This caused my warm feet to melt the snow on the sleeping bag. I got up, got dressed, and saw one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. Millions of windowpane snowflakes slowly turning in the sunlight that was breaking through the clouds. I got on my way and began walking across a huge snow field leading to the tree line. This area is visible in many aerial and space photographs of pre-eruption Mount St. Helens. This finger of trees sticking up into the snow on the south, southwest side of the mountain is very prominent in aerial and satellite photos. As I began walking, the clouds began opening up on the mountain. The snow was still falling. 
I tried to illustrate this, but my illustration sadly does not do it justice. As I made my way to the tree line, I stayed close to the tree line in case I had to duck into the woods to avoid detection. After a fairly long hike, I finally arrived at the tree line. I was tired but ecstatic. I felt as if I had reached my goal, even though I had not actually climbed the mountain yet. I was in a position to do so. The sun that had come out earlier was now gone. The overcast sky would remain throughout the day. I set up my camp near the tree line, laying out a bed of pine boughs and gathering wood for a fire later if needed. I decided to photograph myself against the mountain for proof that I was there. I broke one of the legs off my tripod during my hike to the mountain. Taking a photo was not going to be quite as easy as I imagined, as there was a ridge of snow around the entire tree line about 40 to 50 feet high. This was probably due to the wind-blown snow hitting a wall of trees and curling back into a pile away from the tree wall. In any case, it was hard to climb with just hiking boots on. Crampons were in order. As I had never climbed a mountain, I didn't know what crampons were. I did manage to ascend the rise after using some care, and I decided to use the remaining legs of my tripod as a spike and just push it vertically into the snow. I attached the camera and rigged up my kite string screw shutter release cable. I modified the procedure by placing my Marine Corps K-Bar fighting knife vertically in the snow below the camera. I ran the string under the guard so the string would not have to make a complete loop around the camera and possibly jam or fail to release. As I was setting up the camera, however, I forgot about the slope dipping to the tree line. I lost my footing. I fell on my back and began sliding quickly to the tree line. I was sliding head first. I had, pan I had a panic thought about suffering a serious injury by hitting a stunted pine or slamming into a rock. Fortunately, this did not happen. I spent the rest of the day resting and watching the mountain. I climbed into my sleeping bag at dusk. I awoke sometime around midnight. I don't know the time. I do recall the position of the moon and observed that it looked to be past the noon or midnight position. After reviewing United States Geological Survey records on earthquakes at the time, I noted there was a 4.0 earthquake at 43 minutes past midnight. I think it may have awakened me. I stowed my gear and got ready to climb. I ran into a problem, however. My boots got soaked hiking through the snow, and they were frozen solid. I could not get them on. Fortunately, I had gathered firewood the day before, and I also used my pine resin to help start the fire quickly. After removing the strings from my boots to ensure I did not set them on fire, I stuck one of the firewood sticks in them and thawed them out over my small fire. After about 15 minutes, I was able to slide them on. I had coated them with snow seal to keep them dry. Maybe the snow seal and the moisture helped to harden them up. I'm not sure. I started my climb. The snow was hard packed and solid. The ash acted like a non-skid surface. The moon was full and bright. And what I'm going to tell you next has been disputed by a well-known geologist. I am only telling you what I saw with my own eyes. I was there. The geologist was not. I saw the moon shimmering in heat waves. They must have been very high as I did not feel warm at all. I was mesmerized by the sight. I had never seen anything like it. I tried my best to depict this in my illustration, but I've probably failed in the attempt. I also thought about creating a GIF to show you what I saw. The other notable sight was what looked like at first a forest fire on the southwestern horizon. It was actually the city lights of Portland, Oregon in the distance. An interesting side note is my dad and stepmother were out on their back decks in Missouri 
enjoying the moonlight, when my dad turned to my stepmother and said, John is on the mountain tonight. How he knew that, I do not know. My dad and I had always been kind of close. I guess that explains it. I climbed in short bursts. Even though I was not carrying my pack, it was still a challenge for me. I was trying to climb as fast and as far as I could before daylight, as I would be easier to detect by helicopters after dawn. A feeling of apprehension began to come over me as I saw the first faint light of dawn approaching. As the sun crested the horizon, I observed hundreds of ash devils spinning on the snow and the ash in the pink morning sunlight. The sunrise was awesome. I looked to the west and observed the violent pink of the edge of the earth's shadow on the horizon. I saw a shadow of Mount St. Helens on this color field, which is also called the Belt of Venus. It was so interesting I had to photograph it. My shadow can be seen in the foreground. Sunrise that day was at 0554 hours. I had run out of water in my canteen in the first hour or so. I became very thirsty quickly. I did notice, however, large patches of what I would call ice mushrooms. They appeared to have been formed when spots in the hot ash-covered surface caused the snow to melt in spots under the ash. This formed a small pool, which when heated by the sun, dripped down from the center of the pool and formed a stand of sorts. The sun continued to melt the area around the, these ice mushrooms until they were freestanding. They made me feel better, but were of not much, much use in slaking my thirst. In survival training, you learn that the amount of moisture in your body, your body uses to melt the ice or snow in your mouth is equal to the amount of ice and snow you place in your mouth to slake your thirst. The benefit is mostly psychological. In 0600 hours, a helicopter can be heard approaching from the southwest. Somehow I never see it. It must have passed somewhere to the west of the mountain. I suspect this might have been carrying geology professor Leonard Palmer who entered the crater to take samples. Not sure. A photo taken of him leaving the crater looks like it might have been taken at that time. Mount Adams can be seen to the east. I climbed to a rocky outcrop that looks like old extruded volcanic rock. I sit on the east side next to the rocks, resting and enjoying the view. The mountain at this point curves downward 20 feet toward a very steep drop of at least 500 feet or more. The rocks are about the size of a Volkswagen. All of a sudden, the mountain begins to heave outwardly in and out. It feels as if I will be thrown out and over the side of the downward curve, sending me sliding down the side of the mountain. The rocks next to me begin clanking and rattling from side to side. The ground is squeaking like old car springs or a bed spring. I'm terrified. The heaving sensation feels like a giant circular motion. The time is 0808 hours. The earthquake is a magnitude 4.0. At about 0900, another helicopter approaches from the south. I have nowhere to hide this time. I lie down in a patch of brown ash, hoping my camo and brown coat will do the trick. I pull my hat down over my face and peer from under it at, at the helicopter hovering above me and slightly to the west. The line from the Carly Simon song, I haven't got time for the pain, strangely keeps running through my mind. I must have been exhausted. As I fell asleep, I have no idea how long I slept. After I awake, I immediately jump up and start hiking up the mountain again as fast as I can to make up for lost time. At some time around 11.30, I came to a very steep portion of the mountain. This section would prove to be the most dangerous for me. It would also prove to be the most fortuitous in one respect. It was steep but grooved to a depth of about three to three and a half feet. 
The grooves were created by hot ash, mud, and rock flowing from the warming summit. Had these grooves not been here, I doubt I would have been able to climb this section without crampons and an ice axe. I was able to stand in the grooves and use the tops of the grooves like handrails on the stairs. One of the dangers in this area came from the hot, gravel-filled mud, mud flows which backed up behind large rocks thrown from the volcano and lodged in the grooves. The hot mud had the appearance of of hot cement. Steam rose from its surface. The hot mud would melt the ice on either side of the embedded rocks and the rock dam would break loose and begin bouncing down the mountain in great arcs. I could hear them coming with a thump thump sound. They were spinning at a fast rate. I had to move from groove to groove to avoid their path. The mud flows or many lahars had to be avoided in the same way. Many of the rocks were fairly large and some were as large as two and a half feet in diameter. After an hour and a half of climbing, dodging rocks and small lahars, I exited the grooves and came to a place where the mountain had slid down, leaving a large V-shaped shelf. I stopped to observe steam exiting small pencil-sized holes in the wall of the trench. The holes were in tight clusters much like you might see in a paper wasp nest. I hear another helicopter approaching from the south. I dive into the trench laying on my stomach with my head facing east. At that moment an earthquake hits. A small crack at the bottom of the trench in front of my face begins opening and closing to about three or four inches. I imagine scenes from old movies where the earth opens up and swallows people as they fall into a fiery destruction. As quickly as it starts, the earthquake ends. This earthquake is recorded, recorded at 1351 hours or 151 p.m. It registers at 4.0. I was told by geologist Richard Waite in a conversation with him on the phone that geologist David Johnston was on that helicopter that flew over me. I waited for some time before making a push for the summit, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. I pushed for the summit after not hearing the helicopter. The first thing I encountered were some large cracks running east and west about 10 feet wide six to eight feet deep. Large blocks of snow and ice were jumbled in the bottom of them. I was able to get around them on the western terminus of them. The next thing I encountered was a three and a half foot conical gray green disc. It rose about three or four inches above the surface of the snow. The apex of the cone was about eight inches to one foot above the snow. About 15 to 20 feet north of this disc were two wooden poles with non-stick plastic tape, Dayglo tape, wrapped around them, creating a one-foot alternating section along the poles. The poles stood about five feet tall. 18 to 20 inch streamers were attached to the top and blowing in the wind. The poles were about eight feet apart and were aligned to create an east-west line. I photographed the poles with Mount Rainier to the north framed between them. I avoided standing at the very edge of the crater to avoid falling into it during an earthquake. I was worried about cracks running along the crater's edge that might cause the edge to give way. I worked quickly taking my photos as fast as I could. I considered entering the crater but thought better of it as poisonous gases might be laying at the bottom of it. I just did not know, so I didn't go. I did hike down the western edge of the crater to photograph it. I did not see David Johnston. Perhaps he left earlier. I also photographed what is now known as Johnston Ridge, Mount Rainier, Spirit Lake, and Mount Hood to the south. I also inadvertently captured smoke from a forest fire in progress to the south. I had thought about stopping by Harry Truman's place, 
but scratched that off my list as I was too tired, hungry, and dehydrated. An added note, I lost many of my photos in a fire in the late 80s. I mailed some to engineer Gerald Edwards and Porky's Tavern. Maybe someone still has them. WDAF TV in Kansas City also has some on a video they did in 1980 chronicling my climb. I began plunge stepping my way back down the mountain. Strangely, I do not remember encountering the grooves on my way down. This would be important later when I would try to find my base camp. I wore the outer layer of leather off the heels of my hiking boots, plunge stepping in the ash-filled snow. After about three hours, I reached the tree line. I was exhausted and having a difficult time focusing. I was extremely dehydrated and lost. I could not find my camp or backpack. Panic began to set in. This didn't help my thought processes. After 30 or 40 minutes, I found my backpack and camp. I ate some dried beef, not a good choice when you are dehydrated. I needed water and there were no running streams where I was. I noticed that the ash was warmer than the surrounding snow and had melted below the snow's surface. I took out one of my black plastic trash bags and dug a light bowl shaped depression, placing a trash bag flat in it. I then piled snow on it. I dug a hole below the trash bag and bowl to place my canteen in. The water on the bag melted quickly in the warm sunshine. I soon had a full canteen. I filled my canteen three times and drank at least two canteens full of water. At sundown, I wearily crawled into my sleeping bag and slept until about seven in the morning. I packed up my gear and moved swiftly toward Highway 503. Sometime in the afternoon, I arrived back at the empty logging camp which encouraged me because I knew the highway wasn't too far away. Strangely, I wasn't worried about getting caught. I guess I figured I was on my way out and not in, so they might go easy on me. After traveling for about 15 minutes down the road heading west, I heard a voice call out, Hey, you there, hold it! I looked toward the voice and saw two guys at the edge of the woods on the north side of the road. They looked like hippies, except one was wearing a Forest Service cap and the other a Forest Service shirt. Beyond that, they looked like civilians. One had long hair and a ponytail, the other had long, loose hair with a beard and mustache. I know most Washingtonians consider people from my part of the country Flatlanders. The guy with the beard and mustache asked me what I was doing there. He then pointed to a ridge north of our location and asked, Don't you know there's a volcano up there ready to erupt? I was thinking if he only knew where I'd just been. I played the ignorant flatlander, which wasn't too hard to do, and replied, I'm from Missouri. I don't have any idea where I am. Some friends dropped me off here a couple of days ago, but I don't have any idea where I am. I'm lost. Could you help me find my way out of here? And the guy with the beard said, yeah, just follow this highway and the way you're going. And I thanked them profusely and con continued on my merry way. I hiked a mile or so and I wondered what had happened to the roadblock. I did see a young man parked beside the road throwing a stick for his dog to retrieve. He was surprised to see me and asked me if I had any way to give his dog some water. I told him I had a tin cup and a canteen. He said, great, that should work. The tin cup was special in that my dad had painted Mount Etna Expedition on the side of it as a joke. I filled the cup and his dog drank heartily. We got to talking and he asked me what I was doing in the area. I told him I had just climbed Mount St. Helens and had photographed the crater. He mentioned he was from Portland, Oregon. I asked him if he could if I could possibly get a ride with him back to the Portland bus station. I told him I would give him a roll of my film. I did not give him 
my roles of Summit film, however, he agreed to take me back to Portland, the Portland bus station. This was once again Providence in that it took care of the missing portion of my bus ticket. It was an enjoyable ride in that he was driving a convertible. At the bus station, I met three guys who said they were climbing Mount Adams the same day I was climbing Mount St. Helens. They said they had to abandon their climb because of extremely high winds. Mount Adams is about 30 miles southeast of St. Helens, Mount St. Helens. The bus trip back to Kansas City was pretty uneventful with one exception. As we were passing outside of Wellington, Colorado, I noticed a farm with a giant cross and a field near the highway. This is notable in that my future wife was living on that farm. In those days, it was a Christian commune. Today, it is called Harvest Farm, and it works to help the homeless who are addicted to drugs and alcohol turn their lives around with the gospel of Christ. My family was surprised to see me return alive, I think. I suppose I should have called home when I got to Portland. I just never thought of it. I never bothered to tell my mom where I was going, as she once told me in 1976, after I just returned from hitchhiking to Anchorage, Alaska, that she didn't want to know where I was going, as it would only cause her to worry. I also ran away from home at age 16 and hitchhiked to the Missouri Ozarks. I lived in a small cave on Lake of the Ozarks. I was working in a local sawmill to support myself. I had been influenced by the book My Side of the Mountain, but that again is another story. I turned my photos into Photomat, a drive through film processing outlet popular at the time. It was the fastest way to get your film processed at that time. My dad recommended I get hold of local news outlets and share the story of my climb. Three Kansas City media outlets did stories on my climb just after the May 18th eruption. Reporter Pam Whiting, Channel 9 News, reporter Doug Paul Breckenridge of the Kansas City Star, and Stacy Smith of Channel 4 News. Stacy Smith of Channel 4 featured me on a 30-minute show called Perspectives. Stacy Smith began his introduction with, we are here with volcano expert John Williams, who spent some time on and around Mount St. Helens recently. I'm not sure why he introduced me as a volcano expert. I guess because I was using terms like plate tectonics and pyroclastic flows, or maybe they figured I couldn't have been inside the restricted zone unless I was an expert. I don't know. I don't know. This error was corrected right after the first commercial break. During the commercial break, Stacy asked me what I was doing on Mount St. Helens. I told him I really wasn't supposed to be there and that I had to sneak into the restricted zone to climb it. His face turned ashen and his mouth dropped open with surprise. After the commercial break, he did the lead in by saying, we are here with John Williams, who is persona non grata with the U.S. Forest Service. I'm kind of skeptical now when I see a so-called expert on television. After the show, I was taken around the studio to meet some of the other newscasters. I met Cynthia Smith, who is not related to Stacy Smith, and the station's weather broadcaster, Dan Henry. He was a popular feature on the station. My dad suggested I take him some volcanic ash in an envelope. He was delighted to get it and displayed it on his weather program by pouring it out on a piece of black mat board. On his broadcast, he said I would like to thank John Williams for giving us this volcanic ash he brought back from Mount St. Helens. The Kansas City Stars article got the day of my climb wrong, and that was later corrected by geologist Richard Waite, who used earthquake data and weather data from the description of my climb to determine the actual day of my climb. 
My story is not mentioned in any documentary videos on the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, as I didn't pursue promoting it much beyond local media outlets in my area. It might also be because I'm a Missouri flatlander. I don't know. In 2006, I posted some of my photos on a website called Summit Post, along with a short account of my climb. A fellow contributor on the site contacted geologist Richard Waite, who happened to be writing a book about the 1980 eruption titled In the Path of Destruction, Eyewitness Chronicles of Mount St. Helens. He called me and asked me about my experiences. I can be found on page 72 of his book. In his account of my experience, the first earthquake, he has me swearing. Frankly, I was too scared to even think about swearing. I've been in contact with him recently to clarify questions I've had about things I had seen. He assured me I am not swearing at sub subsequent publications of his book. Dr. Waite has graciously and patiently borne with my phone calls and emails. I would recommend his book to anyone interested in this historic and deadly event. I would like to add that I asked Dr. Waite in one of our conversations if I might be the last person to climb Mount St. Helens before the May 18th eruption. He said that some other people had climbed Mount St. Helens during that time but he thought I was probably the last person to climb it from base to summit before it erupted on May 18, 1980. This is kind of a postscript, I guess, but I wanted to share with you why I wanted to climb a mountain in the first place. I did not share this in the beginning because I wanted to try to get to the story as quickly as possible. I remember watching the movie the Mountain with Spencer Tracy and Robert Wagner back in 1962 and marveling at the fact you could walk around in snow in the middle of summer on the tops of mountains. The movie Third Man on the Mountain was also an influence. They were probably cashing in on Sir Edmund Hillary's climb of Mount Everest in 1953. Oddly enough, I had just read Sir Edmund Hillary's book, High Adventure, in December of 1979, three months before Mount St. Helens started erupting, again after 137 years of dormancy. In many ways, my childhood prepared me for my climb. There were many patches of woods around our neighborhood, and one of them was owned by an underground rock quarry. We liked to spend our time playing around the sinkholes scattered around the property. We were strictly admonished by our parents to stay away from them. Nothing seems to motivate a child to do something more than telling them not to do something. A milk truck was used to haul dynamite that was used to haul dynamite would patrol the property and would chase us off when seen. Sometimes the driver would call in the police helicopter to chase us off. On Fridays, the quarry would set off dynamite in the holes they had been drilling all week. A low rumble could be heard and the ground would shake. Strange coincidence, huh? I will finally close by saying I've, I always hate to hear, please subscribe in a YouTube video. And being an old geezer, the first thing I think is, it's going to cost me some money. After all, isn't that what subscribe usually means? Please hit the subscribe button if you would. Honestly, it won't cost you a cent, and it will help me get my videos noticed. Thank you for watching.